So we're standing in the churchyard of St John and we are standing near the bus garage which was actually the site of the black and white house back in Tudor days owned by Sir Thomas Viner and home to the rumoured um, connection to Elizabeth Stuart, the so-called Winter Queen, Queen of Bohemia. We have no proof but that's in the book. But we're here to talk about what we plan to do regarding walks and what this um, presentation was to do with today. So the six women we're going to talk about today are those that we couldn't really fit yep. onto a route because either it was too far from um, mm. a suitable route or that the house, the location just yeah. isn't there mm. anymore. It's you know now modern flats or something. Yes, and they're too interesting to actually leave out entirely. So there's six and we've had exclusive access to St John's so we've got a few more in in tonight's presentation and then afterwards we have a question and answer session where we will attempt to but we've been talking as we've been going round and some of these women we've spoke about today um, actually aren't even in the book because we've discovered them since that's right we've had emails going backwards and forwards haven't we almost daily emails of uh, new finds mm. uh, of Hackney women um, who we hope might make a second edition if there is one yeah, we hope. Um, but again some of those are far too good yeah, to, uh, to leave out miss. Mm. but we will also be asking for help because there are some things we definitely think there are people still out there who would know about like the London Fields women's squats mm. and the Lenthal Road printmaking place and Women Lesnies. Lesnies. Yes. So there were some very innovative employers in Hackney Wick, especially Clarnico's, Lesnies. So we're hoping that there are people around who can actually tell us because there are things that are really difficult to find out. So we're hoping all you experts out there will we be able to... We need some oral stories, really. We do. We do. So we're here at St John at the effigy of Lucy Lady Latimer, who is pretty much the only sort of physical evidence that we have of all of our Tudors here in Hackney, and there are plenty of them which you'll hear about at some stage over the next talk, and then the book, and then the following book, and everything else that's going to come out about the Tudors. But I'm here with Lucy, and we know a bit about Lady Latimer. So, Lucy, do you want to...? Um, I researched Lucy Lady Latimer, um, who was born uh, surnamed Somerset, uh, but th there's not a whole lot of information about her, but the interesting points are uh, her mother was lady-in-waiting to Anne Boleyn, and apparently mm -hmm. she was one of the ones that informed uh -huh. on Anne Boleyn mm -hmm. as to apparently having committed adultery, uh, which of course led to Anne Boleyn's sad downfall and, and uh, having yes. her head chopped off. Yes, that's right. Um, but Lucy herself uh, was quite high profile at court. She was the maid of honour mm -hmm. to Catherine Howard, another of Henry's wives. She also met a sad end. <laughs> and later on uh, was the lady-in-waiting to Catherine Parr, who was oh. also her cousin. So here we have a good example of these Tudors and yes, their the intermarrying. interweaving and intermarrying. <laughs> yeah. and, so uh, Catherine Parr was the one who survived. Of she was Henry's. the sixth one. Henry's wife and there was I don't know if it was a rumour but whether she was actually our Lucy was actually in line to have that dubious honour of being married to Henry VIII. She was apparently one of three women who <laughs> after Anne Boleyn I think it was uh, was up for grabs mm. but that didn't happen <laughs> so uh, yeah Jane Once. Seymour and then poor old Catherine Howard uh, and then Catherine met Parr. similar fate. Mm. managed. It always reminds me of that Christina of Denmark quote, I'm sure it's sort of paraphrased, but she was in line to marry Henry and she said, yes, I would if I had two heads. <laughs> and I thought, yes, good, good on you, Christine. Um, but this effigy has been recently refurbished in line with the refurbishment of St. John's, but it was originally refurbished back in Victorian days, was it, by one of her descendants? That's right, that was uh, Angela Burdett-Coots. Yes. 
1881, I think it was, she put up some money to have it restored. Mm. So I imagine since then, um, again, it became dilapidated. Yeah. And uh, our contact here at St John has told us that you literally couldn't um, mm. make out this coat of yes. arms before its restoration. They were all black. Mm. And he also told us that the effigies of her daughter, she had four daughters, and each one was apparently on a corner. And they're in such bad condition at the minute, they're in storage, so they're hoping to get those restored somehow and put them back. But that might be a long-term project. But Well, it would be good to see them because those mm. daughters are quite high profile themselves. One of them married Thomas Cecil. Mm -hmm. One of them married into the Percys one into the Cornwallises and the last one you can it's like, it's like the seven dwarfs here you can never quite remember the last one Danvers we think but they all really married well and that was the main aim let's face it of a Tudor woman sadly that was her aim in life was to marry well especially if you were of the nobility aristocracy you really had to Get, get your good marriage in. And I think Lucy managed that quite well. <laughs> well, they did all right because their descendants include the Queen, mm -hmm. uh, the late Princess Diana, and uh, Sarah, Duchess of York. Okay, there you are. So, we move on to our next woman, Edith Watson. Um, she was born Edith Wall in 1888, and to say she didn't have a good start in life is probably, well, definitely not an exaggeration. Uh, she was born in the Hackney Union Workhouse, and she was the illegitimate daughter of a woman called Martha Wall, who was listed as a domestic servant and a single mother. So the images we're showing are the workhouse, which was Hackney Hospital after it stopped being a workhouse, and well basically then and now uh, there's a picture of it looking very grim back in the 1800s. So Edith despite that inauspicious start led an incredibly impressive life by any standard. Uh, she became the first policewoman uh, to wear uniform, she was a campaigning journalist, a captain of Salvation Army, she was a suffragist, she was secretary of a pressure group on divorce law reform, and an early campaigner against female genital mutilation. Her mother, Martha, married Arthur Willett, and the family, including three stepsisters, moved to Marylebone when she was very young. The family were all Salvation Army members, but um, Edith herself didn't become a Salvation Army leader until a bit later. Edith, were, um, thanks to the help of a wealthy mother of her Sunday school teacher, um, was able to go to a very good girls' school called Hamden Gurney. She began to travel, and while she was in South Africa, um, she was working as a children's nurse, she decided to join the Salvation Army. She had that background from her family, but she decided to join, even though apparently she couldn't afford the uniform. I didn't realise that the Salvation Army had to buy their own uniform, but apparently they did. Um, it was then she suffered a sexual attack and was nearly raped by a fellow officer within the Salvation Army. And this experience motivated her later work as a journalist and a campaign for female police officers and court officials to provide support to women while they were going through the legal system. So in 1910, she returned to London and she became involved in the suffrage campaign she wasn't a suffragette, she wasn't on the violent side of the suffrage campaign. She was a member of the Women's Freedom League, um, the non-violent but still militant society. She took part in the protest on the River Thames um, in 1913 when the suffragists sailed past the Houses of Parliament singing protest songs and she was imprisoned for chaining herself to the doors of Marylebone Magistrates Court. She started to write a suffrage column for the Daily Herald. Now, the Daily Herald was, at one point, the world's biggest selling daily newspaper. And it became the Sun, um, but it was actually a Labour supporting uh, paper before it became the Sun, and certainly before the Sun was bought by Rupert Murdoch. So she was also court correspondent for The Vote, uh, the Women's Freedom League's newspaper. 
and she wrote a series of pieces arguing against the injustices of male dominated legal system and comparing the sentences handed down for domestic violence, sexual harassment and abuse and showed how lenient they were compared to crimes against property. And this was in a column ironically titled The Protected Sex. She met her future husband, Ernest Watson, around this time and defying convention, they lived together before marriage. The couple had a son in 1919, but divorced a few years later. And she continued to have live-in relationships after divorce and she never, she never remarried. And she also wrote an autobiography, which has never been published. And I'm hoping it's amongst the LSE's papers, um, which, well, all of her papers are actually held by the Women's Library at the LSE. In it, she describes how female journalists were not allowed in court when cases of an indecent nature were being heard. I don't know whether they expected them to faint or something, but she knew women and girls were not believed when they told their stories and they needed safeguarding as much as possible. And I quote, I think this is in the book, but I think it's a strong quote, which I will read out. Again and again, I heard a girl lose her case because she had not screamed. No man there seemed to understand why she had not done so if her story were true. Why didn't you scream? Because you needed that breath to fight. You were ashamed and embarrassed and wanted to abolish the very memory of it. And she was clearly drawing on her own experience there. From 1914 to 16, she served in the Women's Volunteer Police, which she had actually founded with a friend, Nina Boyle. The service carried out patrols to assist women and children in the streets and to counteract the restrictions that were placed on women by Victorian morality campaigners. Edith and Nina strongly believed that women should have rights to public space. Ultimately, though, the volunteer police were used to control the behaviour of women, particularly working class women, and this was totally against their original aims. So both um, Boyle and Watson left the force. There were up to 5,000 women volunteers in the police in the early days, but in 1922, due to all this conflict, they actually pretty much ceased to exist. Um, and it wasn't, I think, until 1923 that women police officers were officially sanctioned and given powers of arrest. Edith became an active member of the Independent Labour Party in the 1920s, and she became friends with Fenner Brockway, who was later Lord Brockway. He was an MP, Chairman and General Secretary of the Independent Labour Party, and of his first wife, Lila, and they fostered her son for a while. She clearly had problems being a single mother, and that fostering helped her. She carried on campaigning. She disguised herself as a nurse to obtain information for a campaign to improve conditions in mental hospitals. She criticized the Marriage Guidance Council for being too middle class. She led a pressure group for divorce reform and publicized the practice of fem female genital mutilation in Kenya. And she pretty much carried on campaigning for the rest of her life. She died in a nursing home in Worthing in 1966 and her papers are now at the Women's Library, the LSE, uh, where I will be heading as soon as they reopen. Thank you. Hey, we are standing here at the grave of a woman called Anna Maria Lucas. We came across her originally because she was on the so-called slave owner register. This is a register of people who actually were compensated for the loss of their slaves after the Emancipation Act in 1837. Now, Anna Maria lived in Navarino Terrace, which is where the Navarino mansions now are on Dorston Lane, sort of near Hackney Down Station. So it was obviously a quite a wealthy area. Um, Anna Maria, um, daughter of, and it's very difficult to read this even very close up, daughter of Philip and Sarah, who are both buried here too, and also her husband, the Count de Taff, who was of minor Austrian aristocracy. But she was obviously wealthy enough to marry into aristocracy while she was living in Hackney in the early 1800s. Mm. 
So she was compensated for a lot of slaves. I think she got £51,000 in compensation and that would have been in 1837. So that's quite a bit. And there is a link with a woman who is actually in the book. I think Anna Maria will be in the next one. But Anna Maria lived in Navarino Terrace, as I said, but also so did May Broderick, who is in our book as an Egyptologist, one of the first female Egyptologists. But she lived there about a decade after Anna Maria died and was buried here. So there's a near enough connection. So it must have been quite wealthy area even then. And Navarino Mansions was built as a sort of social, social housing and is still standing today and is rather gorgeous. It's that red brick building right on the corner as you go down to Hackney Down Station. It, it is quite frustrating when we're researching mm. um, these addresses that are terraces or places yes. um, that, that aren't <laughs> labelled anymore. Or we have to look at old maps, but, but some of them we just don't get to the bottom of. No. Um, mm -hmm. But that was Navarino Terrace. But uh, th they just did away with the, those sort of yes, um, addresses. And also it's because it's quite near the railway, so I suspect it was taken down as part of the railway redevelopment because that's about the same time, so about sort of 1840s, which is when the railways came to Hackney. And then the sort of nature of the place started to change because... It was the sort of clerks and stuff of the of City of London who started to live here because they could commute mm. rather than the merchants and the East India Company grandees that are also buried here at St John's actually. If you go round you can see all well, these people are listed as East India Company who pretty much ran the country of India for a good few centuries. So the nature, the nature of it changed. <laughs> Do we know where Anna Maria um, had slaves? Well, which, uh... It would have been in St Vincent. That's certainly where her father had the slaves. And she inherited them. I mm. mean, it was just one of those things in those days, as abhorrent as we find it now. Um, if you had money and you invested, you tended to invest in places that were making a lot of money, in which case it was the sugar plantations, etc., of the West Indies. And she had a couple of brothers. One who was actually known as James Mad Lucas, which is probably very unfair, but he, he, he acted, acted, acted as a hermit in Hertfordshire. And he, he's probably another one to investigate, but um, obviously the wrong sex for our, <laughs> our piece of research. So this slave, the slave compensation was mm. part of her inheritance then? It was, mm. and apparently up to 45% of slave owners who were compensated were women but the vast Gosh. majority would have received it as part of their inheritance rather than being directly simply because mm. women of those days were not didn't tend we have come across some who were business women like Eleanor Code for example mm. but the vast majority would have not been directly involved in investments <laughs> But do we know if Anna Maria had any role in managing these plantations? That, that we haven't come across. It's actually very, I mean, you're talking about it being frustrating trying mm. to find addresses. It's frustrating trying to find information even about reasonably well-off women. Trying to find it about working class women is even more difficult simply because they just didn't leave any, yeah. any evidence. Mm. So a lot is actually, and we'll come across another one here a bit later in this presentation, Margareta Beaufoy, who seemed to be mm. a very, very capable woman and would have been lauded in other times, but you can only find details about her in relation to her husband. Well, I suppose people thought it wasn't worth writing down details about a woman. There you go. Mm. Let's hope it's changed. <laughs>
Uh, Siri Morm. Siri Morm was not her birth name. Her birth name was Siri Bernardo, and she was actually the daughter of Dr. Thomas Bernardo, uh, famous for setting up the charity for destitute children in the East End of London and ragged schools and many other things. Now, he was a strict evangelical, so we think that Siri's childhood after she was born in 1879 may have reflected this, the, uh, the evangelical group that he belonged to. Um, they be believed in uh, daily Bible reading, foregoing of worldly pleasures and things like that. So it's possible um, that it was a bit different to her lifestyle later on in life where you shall see that she led rather a luxurious lifestyle. So Siri was born in 1879. We think her first home was at a place called the Cedars, which is um, on Banbury Road in South Hackney near Victoria Park. Um, as you can see from the screenshot right now, this is a map taken from the 1840s to 1860s Ordnance Survey map, uh, which I've sourced from Layers of London. And you can see right in the middle of there, there is a large house called the Cedars. Um, just looking at, at it against some of the other properties around it, um, you can see it's got a curved drive. So um, it was a house fit for people of wealth. Um, and if you look at the next picture, this is a screenshot from Google Street View of what's there now. This building is actually called the Cedars. Um, harking back to the house that was there before, but it is now flat. So that is where Siri Morm uh, grew up early in life. Uh, the Bernardos, so Thomas Bernardo, Dr. Thomas Bernardo and uh, his family, his wife also being called Siri, uh, moved to Surbiton a few years later because they were concerned that the area wasn't fit to bring up their children. Um, and they were still there in Surbiton in 1905 when this photograph was taken. Uh, this is Thomas Bernardo's wife, Siri, and Siri's younger sister, um, who we think may have had learning difficulties, which um, will come up a bit later in this presentation in relation to Siri's son. Um, the Bernardos were still in Surbiton when Dr. Bernardo died in 1905. Now back to Siri. Um, there's a number of portraits of Siri that were taken in 1901. We'll just look at a selection now. And what's significant about this year and the portraits that were taken of Siri is that that year she married Henry Wellcome, later Sir Henry Wellcome, who was a pharmaceuticals magnate and set up the Wellcome Trust. Uh, you can of course visit the Wellcome collection in London and they have many archives, um, which I've taken some of these photographs from. Now, Henry Wellcome was a lot older than Siri. He was 26 years older than her. She was in her twenties. And they had a son, Mountney, in 1903. His baptism certificate shows that they were living in a place called the Oat House, Oast House in Hayes. Again, um, I can't show you the picture because I don't have the copyright, but it was a big house. Uh, so very well off family. And she very quickly uh, would have had to get used to a luxurious lifestyle as opposed to the one when she grew up, I imagine. Uh, we have more pictures of Siri with Mountney. And in fact, I found a quote from Dr. Bernardo's memoirs in which he rejoices, congratulate me and revere me. I have become grandfather to a lovely boy and the darling daughter out of much suffering is tasting the sweets of motherhood. Looks like the lifestyle for the welcomes uh, was one where they traveled the world. Uh, you can see there is a portrait here of Siri and Mountney Welcome at Byritz. And we also have a picture of Siri and Mountney on board a ship in 1905. Uh, not sure where it was going. Um, pictures are very limited of them traveling, but we know they were very well traveling. And there's lots of shipping documents as well that you can find on sites like Ancestry, which I've been trawling through. This is a family portrait taken at home in Hayes. Uh, it shows uh, Henry Welcome there on the right, obviously looking a lot older than Siri on the left and Mountney and other people who we haven't been able to identify. 
Now, uh, what we do know is that the Welcomes marriage was actually not happy. Uh, they didn't uh, seem to share much in common. Siri didn't share her husband's taste for exploration uh, around the world, and she detested his curiosities, his collection of curiosities, uh, medical curiosities, I imagine. And uh, on a joint visit to Ecuador in 1909, so eight years after they were married, Welcome became convinced that Siri was having an affair with an American financier and insisted on a separation. In fact, Siri's affairs do come into the story a fair bit. Uh, so the separation agreement in 1909 um, included granting custody of Mountley, their son, to Siri for most of the year, but with three months with Henry Welcome, um, including during the school summer holidays. And during this time, it became quite clear that Mountney had learning difficulties. You may remember I've mentioned that... Uh, Thomas Bernardo's daughter, Siri's younger sister, also seemed to have learning difficulties, so it may have been something in the family. But back then, it was uh, perhaps not something that um, people wanted discussed in public. Uh, Henry Welcome was um, quite blown by this news because he thought that Mountney might be able to carry on his business, and it looked unlikely. Um, but Siri and Henry had very different views on how to deal with Mountney's learning disabilities. Henry wanted to advocate uh, a strict regime and more teaching, even including during the summer holidays, whereas Siri, who had consulted medical experts, thought that it should be very low key and that she, he should uh, experience a life uh, with a less rigid regime, rigid regime and rest, uh, two very opposing views. Um, to, just to let you know what happened to Mountney, um, see, so actually finished boarding school in 1919 and he was then settled at a farm in Sussex, which suggests that he was put there. Uh, behind closed doors or not, we do not know, but it is what it suggests. And he continued his life as a farmer. We do have a picture of him here at what was called the farming pump. And then another here, when he married his partner, Jean, who he'd been with since 1934, finally in 1960. So we do tend to think that Mountney had, did have a happy life um, and did enjoy his life as a farmer. Now back to Siri. So uh, talking of the affairs earlier on, uh, after the separation with Henry, she went on to have a number of affairs, including with the famous department store owner, Gordon Selfridge. And we do have a record of uh, the property in which Gordon Selfridge put her up in, I imagine all paid uh, expenses wise. And we have a screenshot of where this is. It's overlooking Regent's Park. It's called Four York Terrace. We can find Siri on the electoral roll there in 1915. And it's during this time that Siri um, actually started experimenting with um, what she hoped to do in her life outside of her, her um, partnerships and marriages. And that was to become an interior designer. So she became um, an apprentice at a firm called Thornton Smith. They were a London firm and it was described by the New York Times, this apprenticeship, as almost insolent um, for a well-born British woman to be doing this apprenticeship. But here, Siri learned furniture restoration, curtain design and upholstery, and this was going to stand her in good stead a few years later. Now, in 1915, um, after this affair with Gordon Selfridge, or perhaps overlapping, we do not know. She met a W. Somerset Maugham writer. Uh, one time he was the highest paid writer in the world and they began an affair. Remember that Siri is still married to Henry Welcome. So Henry Welcome finds out about this affair and also the fact that in Rome, uh, Siri had given birth to a daughter, Elizabeth. Um, who was actually put down on the birth certificate as Elizabeth Welcome. Uh, there was a big divorce um, settlement proceedings. Uh, it took a year. Uh, it was filed on the 1st of September 1915 by Henry Welcome. He petitioned that on that date and it was finally decreed on the 30th of August the next year. 
And what's really interesting is that there are documents that in 2019 were open to the public and you can read those on Ancestry. I will just uh, give you a little taster. So they name the co-respondent in the divorce trial as William Somerset Maugham in the trial that's called Welcome Against Welcome and Maugham, which took place at the High Court of Justice, Probate, Divorce and Admiralty Division. And numerous documents ask for witnesses to be called forward, uh, basically saying that they had been witnessed uh, living together or uh, staying in hotels together. And that the said respondent has been guilty of adultery with co-respondent William Somerset Maugham. Uh, so within these files, uh, you can see lists of places that uh, Henry Welcome has put forward that uh, Siri and Maugham lived and cohabited as man and wife. I don't know if there were spies involved here. Um, and that she was delivered of a female child that was Maugham's in May 2015. Uh, this child would grow up to be Liza Maugham. More on her later. Uh, so uh, Siri married Maugham in 1917. They married in New Jersey in America, but they lived at one point at 6 Chesterfield Street in Mayfair until 1919. If you visit that location, which I've got on a screenshot here, you'll see there's actually a plaque there, Blue Her uh, English Heritage plaque to Maugham on the building. And in 1922, while married to Maugham um, and now aged 42, uh, against Maugham's wishes, he disapproved of her doing this, but Siri borrowed £400 and opened her first interior design shop, which was called Siri Limited, on Baker Street. And there she sold furniture, fabrics and accessories. Um, and the rapid success of that shop meant that she moved to grander premises on Grosvenor Square in Mayfair. Uh, her clients have included Noel Coward, Wallace, Wallace Simpson and her husband, the Duke of Windsor, the fashion designer, Elsa uh, Schiaparelli, and the poet Stephen Tennant, and movie star Jean Harlow, amongst many, many others. And in 1928, obviously, uh, the marriage was not going well, uh, especially as it became very clear that W. Somerset Maugham was actually a bit more interested in men. Uh, the couple also didn't spend too much time together, so uh, they had a divorce in 1928 and it was following this time that perhaps Siri was a little more freed up to do what she wanted to do with her interior design business and she expanded opening shops in Chicago, in New York, Palm Beach and Los Angeles uh, where she took on a number of uh, famous American clients. Now, in this divorce settlement from Somerset Maugham, she was given a house at 213 Kings Road. She was also given a Rolls Royce and £3,000 a year for her and Liza. Uh, so Somerset Moore needed to stump up the cash for that. Uh, if you visit 213 Kings Road, you'll see it does have a blue plaque, but this is for the film director, Sir Carol Reed, who lived there a little later. Uh, but yes, a very grand house indeed. And it was here at 213 that Siri created the room that would define her career. Uh, it was a famous all white music room. Um, unfortunately, I can't show you photographs of it for copyright reasons, but I do urge you to have a look um, either during this presentation or afterwards, because um, it really does give you an idea of how splendiferous this room was. Uh, it was covered with fluted mirror walls and it was unveiled at a candlelit party in 1927 where guests included Noel Coward again and it was photographed by the famous photographer Cecil Beaton. Siri used white paint, bleach, white satin, wool and silk, white velvet lampshades and even white lilies for the drawing room. Mirrors and glass made it what a friend called a smiling, shimmering, all white room. And even the curtains had been dipped in cement by Siri to give them the perfect hang. Her parties at 213 Kings Road were described by Cecil Beaton as better for the gossip columns than the court circular. And uh, Wallace Simpson and Edward held private conversations in her library, apparently. And Vogue editors wrote that she had apprehended the sweet uses of light and white. So it really was a go to place to go in the 1920s and 30s, which we um, know were quite an ostentatious time for some people. Uh, and that high glamour look would later influence set design, such as in Jean Harlow's Dinner at Eight, there is an image 
um, from this film I was able to take. It's not the best one that reflects series style, um, but it is the only one we can use for copyright reasons. Uh, again, I urge you to go and look up some images for this film, Dinner at Eight. Uh, it does have good examples if you have a look of the fluted mirrors, which she'd put in the background. So she inspired set designers at the time in Hollywood. Uh, series later career um, involved two decades where she designed rooms for numerous famous clients around the world. Um, but her lack of financial records means that we don't know the full extent. Also in 1932, due to financial irregularities in her books, uh, she was forced to close her shops in America and we've lost a lot of records there as well. So she returns to London and she's known for being hardworking and sometimes hard work. She went through a slipper at a carpet and textile designer and on another occasion told a hesitant client, if you don't have $10,000 to spend, I don't want to waste my time. Uh, now specialising in what we might call today upcycling, uh, she upcycled French provincial antiques, she used a, uh, a method called pickling, uh, which I, I suppose uh, made the items uh, look older, um, and interior designer Elise de Wolf bought pieces from her, and in 1936, uh, Siri sold a house on Kings Road and travelled with Elise to India, where, as a friend described, not me, she painted the black hole of Calcutta white. In the late 1930s, 40s and 50s, Siri seemed to have lived at various luxurious Mayfair and Belfair Belgravia properties, including the Dorchester Hotel and another address on Park Lane. And it was at Park Lane that I found records that she resided when she died in 1955. That was in her probate. Now, sadly, after series death in 1955, uh, Morm published his memoirs in 1962. And of course, Siri not being alive anymore, didn't really get the chance to feed back to these memoirs. Within these memoirs, he virulently criticized Siri and denied his paternity of Liza, claiming she was either the daughter of Henry Wellcome, Gordon Selfridge, or an unknown lover, which caused a public outcry. A subsequent 21-month court case determined that Moore was Liza's biological father, and he ended up having to stump up approximately $1,400,000 in damages. And after his death in 1965, John Beverly Nichols, he was another writer and a former lover of Morms and a close friend of Ceres, he wrote a rebuttal in defense of her called A Case of Human Bondage. Uh, that would be well worth uh, just having a read as well. And finally, through her marriage to Scottish aristocrat and Tory politician Baron Glen Devon, Liza, Morm and Ceres' daughter uh, ended up becoming Elizabeth Hope, Baroness Glen Devon and she died in 1998. Hi, we're at the tomb now of Margareta Beaufoy, who is one of the women in our book. And Lucy has been looking into Margareta's life, which has been, well, probably more the one, one of the more difficult ones to research. <laughs> Yes, I mean, I think perhaps because women weren't considered as important as men back in the 1700s, there wasn't a heck of a lot that we found, um, but we were lucky enough to find um, a bit of information uh, about how she married her first cousin, uh, Mark Beaufoy. Her family um, weren't happy, were they? No, <laughs> the family were Quakers, and apparently the, their, her father was not happy because they were deemed to be... Uh, young still they were 20 yeah, yeah, they were not, not minor now. still i think they were but also the fact that they were first cousins anyway they went to gretna green and got married um defied the family and after that uh, apparently went to switzerland yes they went on a bit of a grand tour almost of europe didn't they and mark mm. mark in switzerland was the first man to climb well first englishman to climb mont blanc is that correct am i remembering rightly yes um, in fact, that's where we've got a record of 
uh, Margareta being involved with his mathematical calculations because he was calculating the latitude uh, before climbing the mountain. Um, and there is a note uh, of him uh, saying that Margareta was a good mathematician. Just Which, a good you know, mathematician. Yes, it's quite understated for someone who probably did an awful lot of work on his experiments, because not only was he a climber, but I think the reason they moved to Hackney Wick was because it was near the site of his, well, of his experiments, really. I think it was a sort of open area where he could do lots of experiments, and it sort of carried along on his family. Well, he'd started experimenting mm. as part of the family business, which mm. was a brewery and a vinegar factory yes. in Lambeth? Yes, it was definitely south of the river, I think. Yes, definitely Lambeth, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, I think his son became MP for Hackney Wick, so the family clearly still stayed there. Mm. And we have a record of him making a balloon ascent. A balloon ascent with James Sadler. Yes. Any relation to Ralph? Uh, not that Ray? I'm aware of. I'd like to find it if it is. Mm. But yes, balloons were quite a thing in Victorian England. Um, the whole floating up in the sky. I mean, we didn't have aeroplanes at the time, so it must have been very exciting. And of course, we had balloon ascents mm. at Vauxhall Gardens. They were quite a Yes. And at sight. Mermaid, which is just literally the other side of the church. And we have a woman in the book that actually took off there. Oh, we have Margaret Graham who took off in a balloon, um, so quite a thing for a woman to do that in those days. Uh, and that was from the Mermaid Tavern and Pleasure Gardens. Yeah. And pleasure Gardens were um, a very popular thing in those days and in fact the Pleasure Gardens from the Mermaid Tavern uh, ran all the way down to the Hackney Brook which is where the bottom of the Narrow Way or Mare Street is now, near yeah. the Marks and Spencers. They're quite a thing in Victorian England, that's what you did on your days off. So we, we know, well, we think we know that they lived at Wick House, which was a, quite a grand building. Wick Lane, Gainsborough Road, that's as close as we can, close as we can actually get it on a map of, our, of those days. Um, but yeah, I mean, a good, good addition to the book. But as, as Lucy says, um, pretty much all of the information we have on Margareta is in relation to her husband. But a good number of Hackney uh, locations, of course, buried here. Um, mm. the parents were from Homerton. Yes. And then settled yes, in Hackney, indeed. Newark. Mm. If ever there was a woman who it's hard to sum up, it's Beatrice Hastings. Beatrice Hastings was a writer, journalist, a poet. She called herself a minor poet of the first class, which is fairly typical of Beatrice, as you'll find out. And she was a prominent member of the Bohemian Paris community that included Picasso and Modigliani. And she was born in Hackney on the 27th of January 1879 at 115 King Edward Road. Now the picture is a picture of King Edward Road in probably one of its earlier forms. It's definitely Edwardian and this is as close as we can get to the time that Beatrice was living there. Um, the house no longer exists sadly. Um, it would have been on the site of the existing Kingshold estate she was named Emily Alice Hay, H-A-I-G-H, and was the daughter of a prosperous shopkeeper and a war dealer, John Hay, and his wife, Catherine. When she was very young, the family started spending time in both South Africa and in London. And this has been led really to some sources uh, claiming that Beatrice was actually born in South Africa. She very definitely wasn't. I have a copy of her birth certificate and there is a document online which I have to say along with a lot of Beatrice detail um, is not a hundred percent well I'm not a hundred percent sure about it let's put it like that it may be true and I hope it is because she actually calls her birthplace Hapney very deliberately and I hope to well I think that's positive. So evidence from the birth certificate of a younger sister proves that the family was back in London in 1883 and living quite close by King Edward Road, so in the same area at 21 Gascoigne Road, which is the road that crosses Wellstreet Street Common. 
Uh, the house doesn't exist either, sadly. Uh, the site is now a block of flats. So in 1891, Beatrice was sent to boarding school in Hastings. This may well be the reason why she adopted the surname later in life. That's as good a reason as any we come across. And she admitted she was a difficult child, but also claimed that her parents sent her away as a punishment. Whether that's true, we, we really don't know. Um, she appears to have made her first marriage at the age of 18 to a South African Port Elizabeth businessman, but she fairly quickly deserted him. Um, she later published a fairly candid account of this almost um, instant marriage failure. And she generally avoided talking about her second husband, um, a professional boxer called Blackland Thompson. Um, now, recent information that I found since the book was published um, states that she formed a musical act in the north of England with her husband. And she left him shortly afterwards and tried to make a career in acting in the United States. Not sure, really not sure about that. Um, certainly at one stage, she did go to Queen's College, Oxford, but this was a time when women weren't allowed degrees, which she fairly um, strongly commented on later. So Beatrice, along with many others who promoted the rights of women at that time, including another woman in our book, Ethel Haslam, um, became a follower of something called theosophy. Um, its most basic is a sort of study of humankind and its place in the universe without any sort of distinction between race, creed, colour, gender, caste, colour, anything. It was a very democratic um, organisation, or well, at least in its aims, I'm not sure in its organisation. Um, notable followers include people like Lewis Carroll, James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, J.B. Priestley, Charles Murray Mackintosh and Gandhi. And today even um, Tom Stockard, the playwright, is a follower. Now Beatrice saw well, she very much was a supporter of women's rights as her writing proves, but she saw women's suffrage as just too limited. Um, just the vote wasn't going to be enough to change anything in her view. And she advocated the importance of individual female agency, individual personality and strength of will. She saw that as necessary to bring about social change and it wasn't just about women getting the vote. And it was at a Theosophical Seminar in London in 1905 that she met Alfred Orridge. Now I'm guessing how you pronounce that name. It's spelled O-R-A-G-E. But he soon bought the journal called A New Age and Beatrice became the literary editor. Um, and she also became Orridge's mistress for about the next decade. Her writing, and this proves the problem with Beatrice, um, her writing was under at least 20 different names. Um, ran from literary criticism to poetry to satire to opinion pieces, and Beatrice was nothing if not opinionated. Uh, she attacked the cult of motherhood and the whole indignity of being forced into perpetual childbirth, the absurdity of universities refusing to give women degrees, and the leadership of the Women's Social and Political Union. So some of the names she wrote under, Beatrice Tina, Dee Treformis, Hastings Lloyd, Minnie Pinnikin, Annette Dawley, uh, Dawley was her mother's maiden name, and Mrs. Malaprop. Now these individuals argued amongst themselves. So she took one persona for one, one persona for another, and argued between the two names. Um, whether she was trying out ideas or whether this was just a form of journalism she liked to do, we don't really know. But it does have the unfortunate effect of making her work actually really difficult to trace. So in 1914, she moved to Paris and she wrote a weekly column called Impressions of Paris using the name of Alice Morning. She almost immediately began a two-year fairly drama-filled affair with Amadeo Modigliani, the painter. Um, first impressions from her were that he was, and I quote, ugly, ferocious and greedy. That view changed soon enough. Um, she, um, he painted her about 15 times as far as we can tell from the records and somebody said and I have no idea who this was but it's so good I'm not leaving it out she had as many faces as voices <laughs> and some of the images that are coming up on your screen will show the very many different paintings that Modigliani did of her. Now their time together was volatile to say the least um, it was called Stormy and Brawfield 
And there's one report that tells of him throwing her out a ground floor window with just her legs remaining in the, over the windowsill in the actual room. But it seems to have been a fairly equal relationship on that. She certainly gave as good as she got. Both of them used drugs and alcohol heavily. Um, they were very poor. There are reports of them visiting a soup kitchen in, in Paris at this time, and it was the First World War. Yeah, it coincides. I mean, I think he was a fairly archetypal artist in that way. Um, it coincides with his most creative spell. He moved from sculpture to painting and he developed this fairly distinctive style that he's so well known for today. Um, he died from TB in his mid thirties, but frankly, it's amazing he got that far. Um, stories abound of his alcohol, drug fuel binges. He was found comatose in a bin um, in a Paris street at one point. Beatrice wrote a surrealist novel uh, about the relationship, which was only, well, it was only discovered in the archives of the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2001. And the most recently sold portraits of Beatrice went for about 10 million pounds and 4 million pounds, but a recent Modigliani went for over 110 million, so who knows what they'll go for in future. So after the relationship with Modigliani ended, uh, she became involved with the poet um, and writer Percy Wyndham Lewis, uh, the, sculptor, the sculptor Alfred Pina, possibly Picasso, possibly Jean Cocteau, and possibly Catherine Mansfield, the writer who she certainly had commissioned to write in the New Age. Mansfield and Beatrice fell out spectacularly when Mansfield moved to a new publisher, and Beatrice was vitriolic about it for the rest of her life. She certainly held a grudge. Her dress sense was legendary. Extravagant hats accessorised with a basket of live ducks as a handbag was a fairly classic one. Um, after the relationship with Modigliani end, there is actually a report of um, uh, Alfred Pina pulling a gun on Modigliani after he turns up at a party where he wasn't supposed to, with Picasso slamming the door on him. So that would make a good scene in any film, I think. Beatrice was also photographed by Man Ray in 1922, and you can see this image online. It's actually quite difficult to get rights to use these photos, so we're being quite careful here. Uh, she looks tired, to say the least. Her jaws clenched. She's got shadows under her eyes. She's not looking great, but still, it was an honour to be photographed by Man Ray. She wrote for the New Age until at least 1920 and moved back to England in 1931. And the last years of her life were largely spent on defending Madame Blavatsky, who we're showing an image of here, the theosophical leader, whose real name was Helen, Helena Petrovna. Beatrice died a suicide in Worthing, 1943, and only, the only reports of her death were in the local paper and a later piece in the Canadian Theosophical Journal after the coroner's report came out. Beatrice committed suicide while she was seriously ill, probably, probably cancer. Uh, the coroner's verdict sounds harsh, suicide while mentally unhinged. She gassed herself using a domestic cooker. There apparently is a plaque to her in Paris, but there's no memorial that I know of anywhere else. Um, and there are a couple of books about her, one which is available online, but the other one from a university in the US who have yet to respond to my calls. Um, so an extraordinary woman, way ahead of her time, and one that really should be remembered for being more than an artist muse. You know about Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Lloyd, although we may have something new to tell you. But a new book from the Hackney Society and Hackney History tells a story of women you may not know, covering five centuries and 113 women who either lived or worked, were born or were buried in today's borough, from the 16th century, the queens and courtiers, the blackmailers and laundresses who lived in Hackney's grand houses, to the radical artists of a century ago. Women who squatted its streets, 
and documented its working life. They chart the changes for women and for Hackney. Hackney takes pride in its radicals. From the civil war, from the entrepreneurs who changed the look of our domestic lives, and from its performers. Hackney is renowned for its music hall artists, but its women also ran theatres and were the producers, writers and designers behind some of Britain's greatest films and pioneered the high street cinema. Hackney was home to the earliest female poets and composers and writers, from the first domestic goddess to bohemian radical. This book delves behind our institutions to tell the stories of the women they house and of those who broke through into sports, into science and into other fields that had always been closed to women. Hello, it's lovely to see so many people here and uh, people from all over, including North America. But uh, as we know from the book, the influence of Hackney women spreads far and wide. Uh, we know that many of you have already bought the book and thank you very much for that and for saying lovely things about it. If by any chance you haven't, uh, then just be aware that the price will go up a bit at the end of the month. So just a, a kind of reminder there. We can tell from the, um, from the things that you've put in the chat that there are already pe people who've got ideas about how we expand and update. And that's something that we've planned to do right from the off. It'll probably be something that's digital so that we can continue doing that, um, well, yeah, endlessly. There are so many fascinating Hackney women, but uh, you'll, you'll obviously appreciate that we uh, we won't be doing anything immediately, but these two, uh, Sue and Lucy, will be giving you new women through their talks and their walks. Um, and they're already, as you can tell, really researching all of that. So I just wanted to start before we go into your questions. Will you, will you tell us, Lucy and Sue, something more about the, the plans that you have for those walks? Because I know that those are pretty well developed and they sound exciting um i'll start with that then uh due to lockdown of course we're a bit delayed um we're hoping um the official sort of tourism guide is that we should be able to run walks from april 12th so fingers crossed nothing horrible happens and we can go ahead with those um we've worked out between us there's going to be seven different routes um so there's two in Hackney itself, um, Hackney Central, which I'm calling it loosely, and South Hackney, which I don't like as a term, but it's as good as any for this. So it's sort of Castleham Road, King Edward Road, that bit. Um, and then we have Oxton, Shoreditch, Dawston, Clapton, help me here, Lucy. Um, <laughs> Stoke Newington, is that the last one? Yeah, that's seven. Um, so we will be advertising those I mean, if you've got the book, the details will be in there as to where we'll be advertising. But one of the slides that has come up has given details of the email addresses. So if you want to contact us, we can let you know as soon as they're ready. And yeah, I mean, we're sort of in the lap of the gods to some some degree, but we are ready. And as Wendy said, there will. I mean, Lucy, you're going to do some of your very specific walks as well, aren't you? I am. I was just going to add so that some of the some of the walks, in fact, I think most of the walks will be very action packed um, because there's probably another 10, <laughs> even more uh, women per walk that uh, can be included. Yep. Um, Sue particularly has worked very, very hard on researching that. Um, finding more women and um, I've thrown a few in as well um, but uh, as some people may know or may not know um, I'm about to restart my bring your baby company um, I started bring your baby guided London walks a couple of years ago and so through doing this work with um, the book the Hackney Women book um, originally I thought that I would be leading some of the walks um, but, uh, sorry, just as Sue is, um, but I think what we're going to do is that Sue's going to lead the walks for, uh, people without babies. Um, and, um, I'm going to run some women from Hackney's history walks as part of my bring your baby company. Um, 
as, as we know, there's quite a big interest at the moment. So it'd be nice um, to be able to provide them for as many people as possible. Brilliant. So get yourselves on that mailing list and uh, and sign up and know that you're going to be the first first to know. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a couple of comments about specific women. So uh, Mary Hayes comes up. She's buried in Abney. She's one of yep. 13 women that uh, are in the book that are buried in, in Abney. Um, she's not memorialised. Most people in Abney aren't. And so I know that there's been a lot of kind of picking through the undergrowth and the stoneware to see if we can find uh, graves, but quite often they're not there. But uh, that doesn't mean that we can't register those women. So there's a, there's a broader question here about uh, which figures were the most difficult to research. And, um, let me add to that, because I know that you two are the most kind of phenomenal historical detectives. You're really relentless in your pursuit of a, of a lead there. Mm -hmm. um, and so as well as telling us about what, what you found difficult, can you give us one breakthrough? Because there were these endless emails that were, you know, yay, look what I've found mm -hmm. out. Um, and what was the one that gave you just the greatest satisfaction? Do you want I to start think, with that? Yeah. Um, I think the moment, because I, I think when I first saw the list, we sort of divided this list up to start with, and all it literally had was a name and a sort of short description, literally like educator, journalist next to it. And I fairly randomly picked them out. <laughs> and... To find Emily Alice Hay was Beatrice Hastings, I think was one of those moments I was flicking through quite late at night and finding all these Modigliani portraits going, this can't, this just can't be. And it was, and she came up with the most extraordinary story. And I sort of, I suppose I vaguely knew about her, but nothing specific. And to find she was actually linked to Hackney was, I think, the, the moment for me. Um, but I think generally frustrating on the trying to, I mean, the difficulty of finding detail about any, especially sort of people like suffragettes, which you would have thought there would have been some detail about, but it's actually quite difficult to get even beyond a name and possibly a meeting place that they once went to. That's about as, as far as you can get. So, yeah, I think it's a general, and also, of course, we're being in lockdown, we can't get to archives. So pretty much all of this has been done online. <laughs> and we know, we all know about the Google rabbit holes, you <laughs> get stuck on and find it's two o'clock in the morning and you really should give. <laughs> <laughs> Great work done, given that context. What about you, Lucy? I completely agree about the uh, Google rabbit holes. Um, I suppose one of the frustrating things through research is the stuff that is pre-ancestry. So you've got a wealth of information on ancestry for particular periods. Mm. Um, but I remember uh, recalling a story that I do on one of my Bring Your Baby Walks um, of Fleet Street, um, which was about Elizabeth Cresswell, uh, mm. who was uh, a brothel keeper uh, during the time of Charles II, um, and uh, it was quite hard to find more information about her, although she was notorious um, at the time. Um, but particularly, I wanted to try and find out where her brothel in Shoreditch was. And Sue helped me out a little by suggesting she thought it might be, um, might have been in the church. Leonard's is now <laughs> the, the more recent mm -hmm. church. Um, although it would have been great to be able to pinpoint it on a map uh, or something like that. Um, I suppose another one that I was happy that was included was Alma Hitchcock or mm. Alma Neville, because uh, as a teenager, I was absolutely obsessed with Hitchcock films um, and uh, knew quite a lot about Alma Revel already. Um, so our link with her is at Gainsborough. Um, so not a residential address, um, but quite a lot of the women in our books are, um, you know, at the places of work. Um, which is something that um, I think we want to explore more uh, mm. places like factories. Yeah, I mean, Lesney's and Clarnico's, both in Hackney Wick, were well known for having fairly innovative 
policies to do with women working from them. I mean, I'm not saying that they were being particularly, um, well, they were doing it for good business reasons, I think, not just because <laughs> it was women's rights. They had a, a big pool of women workers and they had to treat them well. That was just good business sense in their in their eyes. I mean, I think Clarnico's even had crashes and Lesney's had that bus that used to go around and pick up their workers because it wasn't easy to get to the factory um, on public transport. So they used to hire, well, they were specific Lesney buses going up and down. I do actually remember those. So that shows you how old I am. Um, <laughs> but there were, I mean, we came across recently the pictures of, and I can never pronounce this, if it's Akil Sayer, he was a dry cleaner huge dry cleaner business again in Hackney Wick and he had a female firefighting force and there's some fantastic photos out there so yeah it's that sort of thing that we want to gather together plus things like the London Fields women's squats it's all this sort of thing that wouldn't necessarily be written down anywhere I mean there's bits on some academics have gone into to things, but really it's the sort of thing that it will be oral histories rather than I was just going to say else. Mm. oral stories. There was also the, uh, the the pictures you found of the women's football team at Hackney Wick. Yeah, the so-called munitionettes. So when they were working in the munitions factories in the Second World War, they formed football teams. And um, yeah, there's some fantastic photos of these women's football teams on Hackney Marshes. So that's another one we need to we need to get onto. And I, I do need to give a shout out to the Rio here because they they've been I mean not necessarily ones that would fit it in the criteria for this book, um, but they have been really helpful with things like the I think they called it the Sound Kitchen. It was a music thing that they actually hosted at the Rio. And I have to say that Clara Ludsky. I have to give her, I, I mean, if we can get a plaque for anyone, I think Clara Ludsky, um, <laughs> she founded the Rio Cinema. So any of you who love the Rio as much as I do, give praise to Clara Ludsky. And if we can get a blue plaque on her house in Sandringham Road, that would be fantastic. But Andrew, Andrew Woodger at the Rio has been fantastic in helping us. So thank you. Well, we do have a question about plaques, um, mm. about moralising people and uh, a suggestion councillor Williams has said um, something about the referring to the place name in the work that's going on mm. and actually we have already fed into that uh, yeah, the Caslam road yeah. Mm. yeah one of the people that we've highlighted there is uh, Eliza Askew who was uh, a match girl and she was she was also a Hackney resident, and in mm. fact, her sister worked at Clonico. So yeah. uh, mm. it's it's nice to uh, have some way of remembering those women whose stories otherwise just do get completely lost. Um, I so I don't know. I, I'm I'm hearing that Sue's thinking definitely she would like to see some plaques. Is that your yeah. feeling, Lucy? I was just going to say, I believe the Ayers Home um, have been campaigning uh, mm. for a, an English heritage plaque, and I think that they might be making headway with that. Uh, yeah, I really mean, the, the Rio certainly are with Clara Ludsky, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's a, a big vote for, for plaques from the Well, even, I mean, when, when you were talking about Abney, Wendy, I mean, Margaret Graham, for example, doesn't even have a gravestone. Mm. So well, you think... Yeah. Yeah. No, they yeah. don't. And it's only recently that the the Welsh nurse, Betsy Cadwallader, it's only recently she got one. <laughs> so it can be done. OK. Well, you were also talking about photos and uh, there's another kind of line of questions here, which is about how do you how do you um, picture or visualise women before the era of photos? Uh, and that I think that that presented us with some problems, didn't it? I mean, we had mm -hmm. mm. people like Eleanor Code or Louisa Courtauld. We were able to find yeah. the things that they produced. Um, yeah, Louisa Courtauld was an interesting one because there is a portrait of Louisa, and I think it's supposed to be by Zoffany, but the word is that actually it isn't. Um, but she was buried at Christchurch in the grave under the 
church in Spitalfield. And they did, and I'm a bit hazy on this, but they did a whole review of the crypt and a lot of the bones came out and they actually did a scientific experiment where they matched up her bones with the portrait. And the answer was, yes, that's definitely her. So she was reburied somewhere else. I think the British Museum or the Natural History, I don't know, they wanted to keep her as an exhibit, but quite rightly, her family said no. Um, but... Eleanor Code, yeah, I, again, she's buried in Bunhill Fields. Nobody knows where. <laughs> There's no memorial to her at all. And I did find one of her trade cards online the other day. But other than that, no, nothing. So Margaret I think when we're talking about, sorry, Lucy, go on. I was going to say Margareta Beaufoy, we spoke, mm. spoke about earlier on, we saw her grave. I mean, you know, you've got a tomb there and yet you, you don't know what this woman looked like. No. And even some of the, I mean, we had a lot of aristocratic Tudors and Stuarts. And yes, there are portraits of some of them, but even someone like Margaret Douglas, Countess of Lennox, there's only one authentic, authenticated portrait of her. There's some that might be her, but there's only one that actually definitely is. So, yeah, there's quite a few that... It's very, very difficult. And if even if I could find evidence of where the houses were for the Tudors and the Stuarts, I'd be happy. But um, it's quite difficult. I'm getting very into the gunpowder plot thing, as Lucy knows. So we have a, a woman who's linked to the gunpowder. Well, two, actually, if you count Elizabeth Stuart, who was going to be a puppet Catholic monarch if the gunpowder plot had succeeded. But a lady called Anne Vaux, I'm sure that's how you pronounce it, spelt V-A-U-X. She, well, she was played by Liv Tyler in that um, TV series that was on recently. The one with, was it the guy from Game of Thrones who played Robert Catesby? Yeah. Kit Harrington, is that his name? Forgotten what the program. Yeah. But she was played by Liv Tyler. So Anne Vaux was played by Liv Tyler. Um so, yeah, Anvil was actually involved in hiding priests during the anti-Catholic times. And she was based in Oxton. And I have to say Oxton. I always say <laughs> my, my dad is actually from Hoxton. And I've never pronounced Hoxton as Hoxton unless I really, really try. <laughs> so it's Oxton to me. But yes, Anne lived in Oxton. <laughs> so when of course there's a brown plaque. Sorry, there's a, a Hackney Brown plaque um, yeah. mentioning the gunpowder. To Lombard Monteagle, yes. There's a link, the whole, again, it's that intermarrying thing, the Treshams and the Monteagles and the Vauxes, they all intermarried. Mm -hmm. And they all seem to live next door to each other as well. So, mm -hmm. But we came across different problems, didn't we, for different uh, periods and types of women. Mm -hmm. So that with the, with the Elizabethans, you may have, a series of portraits, none of which look anything like the same person. So, nope. you, you know, you wonder what's going on there. But um, more recently, if there some of the women that we were trying to uh, trying to include, the more ordinary women, mm. working women, uh, it was very difficult to find any kind of portrait of them. Um, no, extraordinarily. In yeah. fact, I, th I think um, you really do need to go to the source. I mean, again, Hoxton, Hoxton Hall. Um, they've recently um, publicised on Instagram both a picture of Sarah Ray, who was the Girls of Good Life, ridiculous name, um, but it was a club that helped women to, well, find employment, really. So it trained people for domestic service and things like that. Um, Sarah Ray, and actually today, they published a picture of Mae Scott, who we would have loved to have that picture in the book. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so they're coming out. They're, they're, but yes, I mean, a lot of these women, it is extraordinarily difficult to find information and images. And so, it makes you realise why somebody like Jo Spence, who's in the book, mm -hmm. who uh, yeah. put on the flashes, in the yeah. 70s about mm -hmm. women and work, that she just felt, well, this is, this is completely invisible. It's happening around yeah. everybody. Mm -hmm. It's completely obvious that all these women are going out to work. Uh, and yet mm -hmm. 
it was disappearing. And the yeah. Trade Council put on the exhibition called mm. 50 Years of Brotherhood um, and as a response to that. But it's, you know, it's... Yeah, there's a lot of, the only ones that you can find, thing. yeah, there's a lot of pictures, I think there was a national survey of some sort during the Second World War when they started going into factories and taking pictures of women who had obviously taken over the rock, but that is the only real in-depth series that I came across of women, women working, there's the odd one like that lovely one of all the Klonica workers, but no, it's just not. I mean, even, I, I was thinking of an example. I mean, Sarah Wesker. Um, and if Laurie's on this call, if Laurie Elks is on the call, I've still got your book, Laurie. Um, this is Arnold Wesker's um, autobiography. And there's a picture of Sarah in there. But other than that, I mean, fantastic trade union leader. You know, I mean, there's no picture of her. There's a picture of her literally in this autobiography of her at a wedding. And that's it. So, yeah. Okay, well, lots for us to do then. And uh, still people are coming up with, with suggestions. So I'm hoping that everybody who's um, still listening in realises that uh, we're very happy to receive any suggestions, yeah. any bits of information. There is a, a special email for that that's uh, in the introduction of the book. But honestly, use use any way of getting hold of any of us it'll we'll uh, we'll work that out mm -hmm. um so i think that may be all of the questions uh do you want to finish us off by just highlighting don't give the story just highlighting one uh one woman that that you think that people should really go back to the book and have a look at because I know that people just dip into the book which is great yeah yeah um who shall I think of I mean obviously I have my favorites um well, I think your favorites is what I'm asking for <laughs> they're the ones I talked about on the <laughs> so be actually no Dor Dor I'll give Dorothy Levitt a call out she does have a plaque actually obviously it's not an English heritage one but if you go to Colston Crescent she has her but yeah, I remember us talking about the, the lots of pictures of Dorothy Levitt. She was a very rare, rare breed in this in this research. There's lots of pictures of her, and I re highly recommend her book as well, where she talks about um, using her hand mirror as a rear, yeah, um, and keeping a dog in your car and a gun. <laughs> Which, yeah, okay then. Um, but yeah, she sound, but again, she was an interesting one on the because they tried to market her as a oh look, women can drive sort of thing. But the descriptions of her being a meek and little lady just learning to were so different from what she was actually doing that it was an interesting it was an interesting so I'll give Dorothy I'll give Dorothy a shout out there. <laughs> okay. Lucy, who are you going to? I, I suppose I'd better mention um, the two women that um, I nearly talked about this evening, although um, Siri Mormon herself was quite um, a lengthy talk and she had such a, um, a busy life. Um, but uh, Helen Bamba uh, was one of the women that I did want to talk about. Unfortunately, um, it was a bit of a struggle to uh, come across images that I could use of Helen. Um, but she was um, the first uh, female chairman of Amnesty International um, and, of course, the Helen uh, Bamba Foundation is still going today. Um, so definitely worthwhile having a look at her. The other one was Jessica Tandy, uh, who was the oldest woman, no, I think oldest person, in fact, to be awarded um, a Best Actor Award at the Oscars, but she had a very um, successful acting career and people may not know that she was born on Gelderston Road in Stoke Newington, um, which again is a bit off the beaten track for Sue mm -hmm. and I to uh, do a walk on that particular road. It's about 10 minutes walk from Stoke Newington. Um, so I was going to talk about her, although that hasn't happened. Um, the other one who's one of my favourites, I think, is Jane Daniel. Um, mm. I know that uh, Hackney did a 
a big um, a website about Tudor Hackney um, about 10, 15 years ago. And the Daniels were included, their story was included, but it is a fascinating story involving blackmailing the Earl of Essex, who was Queen Elizabeth I's favourite. Um, so you might want to delve more into that. In fact, um, uh, I think it was Wendy or Sue that earlier on this week um, came across more documentation um, as to uh, these petitions um, that were raised um, to do with all this intrigue. So I will say no more. You can investigate it yourselves. Okay. Well, I'll throw in to um, Elizabeth Chivers, who threw mm -hmm. her three-month-old daughter into Clapton Pond, worth yep. telling out the story behind that. And then for all the Hilary Mantel fans out there, uh, Helen Sadler. Mm -hmm. um, shines through in that yes. trilogy um, as a wonderful woman and very private. We don't know much about her, but we know enough. So it's worth checking out uh, that entry too. So mm. I think I think that kind of wraps it up. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Yes, thank Do you. Keep in touch because we know that you've got things to, to feed into the ongoing work and uh, we're very grateful for that. Um, people are asking, where can you buy the book? You can buy the book at all good bookshops. And if they haven't got it already, we can get it to them within, you know, 24 hours. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Lucy and Sue. Thank um, you. We'll all be on those walks. Good. I'll see you there. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you.